This week we have a special episode to kick off the new year. Reed Pretty, member of the U.S. men's national volleyball team for 16 years. Uh, he participated in four Olympic Games, multiple medals, including gold medal. And we got a chance to talk to him about uh, leadership, team, culture, fitness, wellness. Uh, he has a new leadership program called Max Potential, which I got to sit in on. It's fantastic. Uh, new wellness program in sand. I actually participated in that as well out here on the uh, beaches of Huntington Beach. Uh, it's sort of a mix between uh, CrossFit and sand volleyball. A lot of uh, really cool uh, new exercises they're able to do uh, because it is in sand. Uh, so it's a, a fantastic program. A very exciting conversation and I'm happy to open the new year with this episode. Welcome to This Week in Health IT Influence where we discuss the influence of technology on health with the people who are making it happen. My name is Bill Russell, CIO coach and creator of This Week in Health IT, a series of podcasts, videos, and collaboration events designed to develop the next generation of health IT leaders. This episode is sponsored by Health Lyrics. Uh, I coach healthcare executives on uh, technology, strategy, vision, and execution. Uh, coaching was instrumental in my development as a CIO, and I'm excited about the progress that my clients have made over the past couple of years. Uh, with this service that I offer. Uh, I have one more spot open for 2020. Uh, if you're interested in talking to me about coaching, please visit healthlyrics.com to schedule your free conversation. A uh, little explanation about the background. Uh, we sold our last house and we decided to do a bucket list item, which was to do a destination uh, Christmas and, and New Year's. And so we took a three month break between our last home ownership and our next home ownership. And we rented this place and uh, it's a bucket list thing. That ocean you're looking at is fantastic, but it is ice cold and you can only go in it with a wetsuit on. So um, it's really about the views. You're looking at Catalina. I'm looking at uh, mountains with snow on them. So this is uh, one of the most amazing places to, uh, to film this, even though the lighting's not perfect, but we're, uh, I, I, I'm gonna do it while I have the opportunity. So uh, as I said, I'm excited to uh, share this conversation with you. Uh, Reed has such great insights based on his experience uh, with the US men's team. Uh, great conversation. I think you'll get a lot out of it. We talk uh, about the journey that high performing teams go on. Uh, and we also delve into the uh, individual journey that uh, members of the team go on as well. Uh, you know, I learned a ton and I think you'll get a lot out of it as well. I really hope you enjoy. Reed Pretty. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, 16 time, or 16 years, professional indoor volleyball player. Yep. Uh, four Olympic Games, uh, number eight, U.S. men's national volleyball team. Aren't you impressed that I memorized Good all Good job, things? man. <laughs> uh, you know, golfer, entrepreneur, uh, father, friend, and uh, thanks. Thanks for coming yeah. on the show. Thanks Appreciate for having it. me. I like that you put golfer in there. That's yeah. more aspirational than it is uh, <laughs> golf. anything else. So uh, golfer isn't in the same category as volleyball? <laughs> no. Maybe from a passion I've seen you yes. play. I mean, yes. from a passion standpoint, you, you do love it. Yeah, I'm all in. You're, you're all in on, on, the, on the golf. Um, well, we have a lot to talk about. I mean, there's, yeah. uh, you know, it's interesting because someone might say, you know, what does this have to do with uh, health IT? And it has a lot to do with health IT because I sat through your Max Potential program and I thought, man, there's so many leadership uh, principles and things that I wanted to share with my audience as I sat through that. Uh, you have a new program in sand that's, that's right. about uh, health and, and fitness, and it really uh, relates to your journey going from hard court to uh, um, to sand volleyball to right. professional sand volleyball. So uh, that's where we're going to start. Tell Great. us about your volleyball journey. So yeah. how did you? Uh, you don't just become a professional volleyball overnight. <laughs> Yeah, that's right. So I started pretty late. Uh, I played all the different sports and it was right around 15 years old, going to be a freshman in high school. And um, I just tried it in a PE class. It was a PE requirement where you do everything. And I guess the coach saw something and encouraged me to come out. But at the time I was only five feet, four inches. So <laughs> I'm not quite sure what she saw. And uh, so I tried out and I loved it. And I'd been playing baseball, basketball, and a lot of soccer up to that point. I did some swimming, but uh, there was something about volleyball that was just different. And I was successful on my first team, which was interesting, even though I played just in the backcourt. And then um, our biggest claim to fame that year was we were on the junior varsity and we went 11 own conference in JV, which is a big deal to us, but we beat varsity in a scrimmage, which they probably weren't even trying. And they were like men and we were still like little kids. So that left an impression, but uh, that kind of just kick-started off and I loved it. 
and um, eventually just one door after the other just kept opening. There was no plan uh, like it is today where everyone sort of at eight years old knows exactly what it is that they want to do. Right. So yeah, it just kind of was a passion that turned into a profession. Wow. <laughs> so did you end up going to college and playing? Is that how it, how it progressed to professional? Right, so I, I played through high school and uh, uh, went to college. And it was in college that it was about uh, my second year in college that uh, there was a USA volleyball tryout and I tried out and I actually got cut, didn't make it. And then the next tryout happened two years after that. And I did make that team. And um, I played in the World University. Well, I was supposed to play in the World University Games, but I tore my ab. It was our, like we had eight days of training. And it was my first USA experience. So I like was just uh, full out, full throttle. And I ended up tearing my ab. And uh, uh, I think everybody else was kind of used to that environment. So they weren't maybe <laughs> as eager as I was. <laughs> They're like, hey, that's what you're supposed to look like at the game. Right. But. So um, that actually kept me out of going to the World um, mm -hmm. University Games. But what it did do was they flew me out to Colorado Springs, which is where the national team was. And that was the first time that I sort of saw the national team, uh, realized it was a thing, and saw the Olympic Training Center, was able to be around the A team. And that was really formative for me. And then I met up with the team for a Pan Am Games. And that was my first initial, uh, actual experience competing internationally was in Winnipeg, Canada in 1999. Wow. So uh, so that, that really was a vision casting kind of thing when they brought you to that, uh, is it Colorado? Yep. Yeah, so they brought you out there. You got to uh, interact with the players, interact with the coaches, see the facility. And when you say formative, it's one of those things where it sort of clicks, doesn't it? Right. And you go, yeah, this is what I want to do. Exactly. That was like sort of first base for me the very next summer. Uh, so during that time, I, I could have tried to make the 2000 Olympic team, and, and like, uh, but I would have had to redshirt my senior year of college. And again, it was still so new. I had so many friends and things going on in college. I, I had this thing in my mind that I just wanted to finish in four years. So I ended up saying no to that. But what they did do was invite me out as soon as I graduated college. And so I was with them the entire summer and I was being told, hey, we're like, we like what we see, you know, spots 11 and 12 on this 12 man roster are up for grabs. Uh, maybe you could be in that spot. Uh, eventually I did not make uh, the 2000 Olympic team. And that was probably the moment that was really catalytic in terms of like, I've seen enough now to, to recognize that all of this excitement and build up to the Olympic Games, uh, whatever it took that those guys had to leverage and sacrifice uh, over over the previous four years, I was now in to uh, making those same sacrifices to, to be on the right side of the roster the next time. So it was actually failure that was a catalytic event. Is that is that normal for you that it's? Uh, you know, it's become the ne the, my narrative. Um, and I didn't know it at the time, obviously, but uh, and, it, and in fact, it wasn't even until I, I retired in 2016 that I actually had time to look back and sort of process of like, wow, OK, that experience was pretty awesome. Like, what are the tangible takeaways? And the number one thing is I would define my career not by what I won, but what I, what I lost. So take us to the first uh, the, the road to the first Olympics that you go to, which is the first uh, 2004 Athens, Athens. OK, yeah. So take us on that road. What, is, what does that look like? So, uh, you know, uh, there was a little bit of an exodus from the 2000 team. Uh, so I was kind of thrust into not just on the team, but on the court. And I kind of held court for the next four years. Uh, but I was still pretty young and inexperienced. And I was playing professionally overseas as well, um, which was sort of a rude awakening, too, of, of what does it look like to be, uh, you know, kind of a boy amongst men um, in this professional life. And... Uh, but I managed it and made the roster in, in 2004, and we did what we needed to do to get through the preliminary rounds, and we played Greece in the quarterfinals. So home crowd, 15,000 crazy fans, and uh, they ended up getting up on us in a best of five match series. They, they got up two to one, and they were up 20 to 12 in the fourth set. And anybody that knows volleyball out there, this is like insurmountable situation this you know there's never a comeback because you score every time the ball is entered in play right. not just uh, when you serve not just when you serve so a comeback under those scenarios those circumstances is 
is, you know, is perfection. You almost... Exactly. And we happened to just turn the tide and we won that set and then we won the following set 16-14. So it even went overtime in the fifth set. And I remember talking about loss, you know, I remember thinking, well, that was a crazy win. Like that was, this is now destiny. And I remember thinking to myself, um, this is really happening. Like our experience, our gold medal experience. And the very next match was against Brazil in the semifinal. And we go out there and lose, you know, quicker than, a, a, you know, it was 3-0 and we were out. And then in the bronze medal match, we faced Russia, same thing, 3-0 and we're out. And it was devastating for me. And it was uh, very interesting because I don't think at the time I recognized that I was carrying some sort of expectation of like things should work out a certain way uh, because I'm trying to connect the dots of the, the data pieces that I know. Uh, and that was probably the moment where real learning took place, you know, so if the first loss was sort of I was ready to create time and space and make the sacrifices necessary to to make an Olympic run. This was now where I was ready to do whatever it took to win a medal. And I think that that was sort of the moment of, you know, 2004, 2005, where I started to really learn what it what it looks like to become a champion. That's interesting because it sounded like you had already made that jump. In my mind, you've already made that jump you uh you're playing professionally you're probably working out like crazy i would imagine and you don't do anything sort of <laughs> you're, you're all in when you're all in so um but what you're saying was there was another level yeah beyond that yeah i think like i said i think that first loss was was like okay i'm ready to to separate from you know my my social group was here in california i had to go live in colorado springs where i didn't know anybody um, no family, no friends. Initially, I ended up building a great community there, but or being a part of a great community. But that took time, space, energy. But the the next level was now I'm ready to do whatever it takes. Right. And typically, whatever it takes is a lot of um, uh, death to self, in a sense, if if I could use that terminology. But it's 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 I was now ready to leverage anything and everything, even if it meant my own ego, uh, towards the greater cause, which was winning an Olympic medal. That's, that's interesting. And, and it's, the, the reason it's fascinating to me is a lot of people would say that you've already been successful. You've been on an Olympic team. I mean, you could have retired at that point, gone over to the country club, played golf, and told everyone I played on an Olympic team. And it's the appearance of success, right? Versus actual, what you were setting out to do, which was to, to win the gold medal. So formative event, take us to, that's Athens. Now we're going to? To Beijing and, and this transition. So I don't think I was, uh, I don't think my development was in a vacuum. I think that our whole team was sort of going through this sort of process. And right at that time we had a new head coach come in and the very first thing that he had us do was sit down in a room in Anaheim uh, at a hotel, the Hilton down there for two days and talk about our feelings <laughs> and talk about our goals and articulate them with words and actually put them on a piece of paper. And at the time we were just like, like, Hugh, what do you mean? Like, we want to go get sweaty and like duke this out. And, and like, we've got a job to do. We got to go, yeah. you know, get better and compete and scream at each other. But thankfully he had a thick enough skin to sort of endure all the darts that we were throwing his way. And out of those two days, we, articulated you know he took us through this process without us even recognizing the impact that this these two days would have yeah. he took us through this process to, to articulate um, a very clear objective with a how to, you know this is how we're going to do it and what was interesting about that day is is that became the marching orders and so every single day uh, we would start our day at the whiteboard and we were finished at the whiteboard and there would always be up in the upper right corner something that referenced our ultimate goal, which was to win the Olympic Games in Beijing. And mind you, I, I do want to say that at this moment in time, if anybody else in the world of volleyball had had seen the U.S. men's team articulate it this way, they would have laughed at us. We had no right, in a sense, um, to think that this was possible. We weren't trending. Nobody was talking about us like, oh, USA, they're, they're gonna be the next, like, look out for them. Like, that wasn't what was happening. Uh, but what it did was it set our culture in motion of a culture of, of learning, a culture of purpose and mission. And, uh, and on we went through that quad and we really became, uh, a lot of the language of our coaching staff was, we're, we're here to be masters of our craft. Uh, we're here in process. 
And so all of this language that was not, hey, we're here to be undefeated. We're here to win every game. Right. It's like we're here to learn and keep learning and keep doing this thing together. But our ultimate goal, yes, is to win something. But the way we do that is we learn along the way. Yeah, and I love, I love that story. I actually shared that because you shared that story in the, uh, in the session that I went to uh, Max Potential. And, and we were, uh, and the next morning I shared it with one of the CIOs that I'm coaching. And he goes, you have to send me that, that <laughs> mission statement. And the mission statement's out there on the, on the, on the internet. And we'll, we'll share it with the show as well. And it was interesting to me. It did say, you know, to, to win, but it, it talked a lot about process, talked a lot about le- becoming students and learning the game and, uh, and getting better and, and the team aspect. I mean, it was all wrapped. It was, it was a beautiful statement. Yeah. Um, but I think the other thing that really, really stuck out at me was when you said, and every day after practice, we would come back in and say, have we taken a step towards this or have we taken a step away? And uh, the thing I loved was you said, you know, I've been on a lot of teams where we have a throwaway practice a week kind of thing. Right. He goes, and you essentially said uh, over those, over those years, it was maybe two throwaway practices for the entire duration. Yeah. I mean, goosebumps as you're saying that because um, it was special and and um, it's really true like great teams would have a throwaway practice you know where it's just kind of like we got sweaty everybody was here with the right you know intention to get something done but for whatever reason we just didn't get it done uh, but that particular group you know there was like two days that were throwaway days uh, in an entire quad which is so hard to do and so there was a serious commitment by everybody to basically leverage their whole selves and and there's lots of stories that I could talk about of, of moments where players had to say no to themselves um, and, and, and yes to the we, you know, to the collective. Yeah. And it was beautiful. And, and in the end, I mean, that particular team suffered some really catastrophic circumstances with our coach's family in the first week. Um, uh, he, he had married uh, Elizabeth Bachman and, and, and Wiz, we call her, and her family were walking in Tiananmen Square and they were attacked. Her father was killed and her mother was stabbed repeatedly. And it was just horrible. And so we had to sort of um, be without our leader for the entire preliminary rounds. And then he rejoined us in the, uh, in the, in the uh, medal rounds. Um, and, and he'll be the first to tell you that we didn't win because of that, in spite of it. Uh, we had trained in such a way to, um, and, and the culture was so tight that it sort of was able to uh, endure that sort of. I'm, I'm going to camp on this for a little bit because yeah. the, the stories are so powerful. Are, are there other things the coach did in terms of uh, communication, motivation, um, the, the whole operating as we that, that you remember? Yeah, you know, I think what really stands out. So I'm a big uh, support challenge matrix guy when I think of coaches and leaders. Um, and I believe that the best Leadership is are those that have um, high challenge, so they're they're making sure that 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 um, that everyone's feeling stretched, uh, but there's high support. I'm right there with you. So I believe you can do more, Bill, and I'm going to challenge you to do more. But I'm I'm right there with you as you do that. So uh, Hugh was definitely uh, high support, high challenge. Um, uh, so. The two, but the two things that, that really stood out was that he was missional. It was on purpose. And all the coaching staff would have language like uh, we used to have, you know, the late Carl McGowan, um, who was a long time, just one of the great coaches of the game. Uh, he would just come in and just be like, well, boys, we're here. So we might as well be here. <laughs> and we knew what he meant by that. It was like, we're not just here to go through the motions, even though we probably could. We were probably good enough to just kind of fake it. Yeah. Um, but it was about, you know, conscious, every rep, um, you know, Hugh used to say every cell in your body is listening to your thoughts and, you know, like every rep is sort of, you know, creating this, this firm, uh, loop. Um, so he was missional, but he was also relational. And this is a really uh, rare thing in, in our day and age. And I think it's a hard thing to do, but he, I think that staff recognized that every individual in our gym was unique. And um, how you would speak to me to motivate me might be different than how you would speak to you. And so he used to always say, uh, we're going to be fair, but not equal. 
right. you know, the 36 year old uh, has earned some liberties. Uh, the 22 year old, I'm sorry, you're not going to have, it's not going to be equal. Um, and so I think, I think recognizing that like, Hey, to get the best out of this group, we got to be knowing exactly, you know, what's the commander's intent, where are we headed? Let's be clear on that. But at the same time, I'm going to do the work to create relationships with each of these individuals to know how I need to speak uh, with them. And I'm sorry, the coach's name was? Hugh McCutcheon. Hugh McCutcheon. Great. And uh, all right. So what do you what what do you recall from Beijing? I mean, because you don't you don't just show up and like, hey, right. we did all this great missional stuff. We're, and you, it doesn't I mean, there's still challenges along the yeah. way. I mean, obviously, you talked about one. But any anything stand out on the court? It does. And I would probably take you back two weeks before we get to Beijing. Um, but I think just in general, like my my thought process, and it was largely shaped by this experience, is that uh, what we were pursuing was mastery, which is more like martial arts, like a black belt. You know, um, you have to spend time developing the tools around your. So you're, you're never pursuing perfection. It's, it's you're trying to level up in skill acquisition and situational knowledge, um, communication within your team. But in the end of the day, you don't know what you're about to experience. So yeah. the goal is that you have the tools you need. Um, a part of that process is recognizing that you are in process. So even though we went to Beijing, we were certainly not perfect. And two weeks leading up to that, we were in a tournament down in Brazil called the World League. And we were we got absolutely killed by Serbia. And we completely fractured as a group. And we were in a locker room and Hugh, our coach, was talking to us. And I, I remember at that moment, it was just sort of like, probably hitting me and bouncing off of me. You know, I've heard his words before. I was really upset about the game and how it made me feel. But our captain, Tom Hoff, when he was done, maybe even almost interrupted him, kind of stood up and just started railing our group. And essentially it was like, hey, when we set out to do this, it was never by ourselves. Like we are here to do this together, whether we succeed or fail you know, the primary thing is that we're connected and we're doing this together. And we never let another guy off on his own. You know, we were going to our, each of our little corners, like this isn't a bunch of silos where, and I just remember it just being such a huge shift. I think it was an important separate se uh, secondary voice. Um, but from that point on, we were, it was like the last moment of, of cohesiveness that needed to happen. And we were in a lot of tough moments, but in terms of on the court in Beijing, I just remember like my pregame routine was, um, we would play cards. We had this game called Finiente, which is just kind of like a spades game that has been in the national team program for like 40 plus years. It's kind of cool. It's like a tradition. Yeah. Got it. So we would, we would play that and, 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 uh, and any bus trip that we could or whatever. So there'd be a time of just like light snacking. We're in the locker room probably early because you don't want to rush and, but then there's this moment where, okay, I'm going to put my shoes on. And when I, when I start to go through that, then it's time to work. And I remember during that period of time, which was so special because before you like win, but you're good enough to win, yeah. I feel like it's the, the perfect place to be in terms of enjoyment because there's like, like this unknown, there's no expectations of like, I should win. Right. So when you win, it's pure joy. And, um, I just remember thinking like, all I, get, all I have to do is prepare myself for work for three hours. So I put my shoes on and literally just tell my, myself, all right, three hours of work, let's go to work. And that's such a different mindset than if you think of like younger athletes or when I was younger, I'm thinking about like, oh man, is my, you know, how's my arms, how am I feeling? Right. How is the first couple points gonna go? And whether they're good or bad, they, that could dictate my emotional State going all the way State through. State going all the way through. But when we had this group of people pursuing mastery that had tools around our belt, it was simply going to work. And we were no longer um, reactive to the situation. And the best compliment I've ever heard of any team that I've played for was that particular team by an announcer that says, you know what? I can never tell the score by looking at them. Whether they're down by eight or up by eight, they just play the same way. And I think that's a testament of the true mastery of, you know what, the game might go our way or it might not, but will we have what we need around our belt to handle any situation that comes up? And that's how we're going to do it. It's amazing. So uh, win gold? 
Yep, we win gold, and it wasn't a... Is every game like an away game at the Olympics, or does, is it sort of mixed? It's pretty neutral unless you're playing the home team. Uh, but it's pretty neutral. I mean, it's... They just like good volleyball. Yeah, and, it, you know, it's great crowds. Volleyball draws a great crowd, and also you recognize that there's, you know, tens of millions of people around the world that are now interested right. in this game that you do every day, but they just see it every four years. Unless they're here in Huntington Beach and we're right. backdrop. And uh, one of the reasons I wanted this as a backdrop is, uh, you know, I, I would run on this pier every morning and uh, and somebody goes, you realize that professional sand volleyball players play there every, all, all the time. Yeah, yeah every day. Uh, uh, and there's, yeah, sort of a little competition to get to the to the front court and, right. uh, and whatnot. Um, so you win gold. I got to see that gold. That was, yeah. that, that was interesting. Um, and, I mean, does does winning have the same impact as losing in terms of catalyzing you and saying, yeah, I'm, I'm ready to go and do this again? Great question. So I think by and large, most people learn more when they lose. And uh, if you take a sports team or even a business, uh, uh, you know, a failed sales trip, um, there is more debrief, there's more communication, there's more analyzation, like why didn't that work? I, I thought we had a great game plan, um, why didn't it work? And so there's this discovery process that everybody seems to be more heightened and aware of under failure. Um, and in the sports world, when there's a win, and, I, and I'm finding it to be the same in business as well, is you sort of gloss over some of the things that, that you might have addressed otherwise. You, maybe you're not meeting as much, you're not having that hard conversation. Yeah. Um, or you, you attribute it to this great PowerPoint that you had when actually it's really the relationship that you developed over years. Right. And you're just attributing it to the wrong things, the success. Totally, and so what I call the double black belt. So if, if black belt, if martial arts, and the reason why I use martial arts, because if you think of boxing, Boxing is all result driven, right? It's, right? it's all about record. Whereas, whereas the, the original uh, black belt was actually white, but it became black over time of use, which I think is just so great. Uh, so to me, the double black, like the ultimate in terms of mastery of any domain is if you approach every situation with the same level of discovery. Uh, so if I go through a win, I don't just turn the music up in the locker room and, and forget that thing that happened between you and I that we should discuss and, and learn from. We just don't think about it and we talk about what are we gonna do? Are we going to dinner? Are we gonna have you know some drinks or whatever? Whereas, uh, so to me, the double black belt is are those, those teams and people and leaders that look at every opportunity as a moment to learn. We'll get back to our show in just a minute. As you know, Health Catalyst is a new sponsor for our show and a company I'm really excited to talk about. In the digital age, cloud computing is an essential part of an effective healthcare and precision medicine strategy. And we've talked about it many times on the podcast, but healthcare organizations themselves are still facing huge challenges in migrating to the cloud. Currently only 8% of EHR data needed for precision medicine and population health is being effectively captured and used. That's 8%. One of the things I like about Health Catalyst is that they are committed to making healthcare more effective through freely sharing what they have learned over the years. Uh, they published a free ebook on how to accelerate the use of data in the delivery of healthcare and precision medicine. You can get that ebook by visiting thisweekhealth.com slash healthcatalyst. And uh, you know, this is a great opportunity to learn how a data platform uh, brings healthcare organizations the benefits of a more flexible computing infrastructure in the cloud. I wanna give a special thanks to Health Catalyst for investing in our show and more specifically for investing in developing the next generation of health leaders. Now back to our show. Plus, how much how much changed? So you're going to Rio now, right? Uh, or, Tokyo. Tokyo up. next. Okay, so Tokyo's next. You're um, you're getting ready for how much changed? New coach? New? Oh, I see what you're saying. I'm players? sorry. Yeah, we were going to London next. Oh, okay. And then Rio, and then the next one, 2020, is Tokyo. But yeah, oh, okay. lots of change. Every quad we had a we had a change in coach and. And that changes the dynamic of culture, and we could have used some probably change management <laughs> teams to come in and help us out. Well, yeah, because that's a significant, because you that team, you the way you describe them, they've become very close. So I would assume that to a certain extent, it's hard to come into that. 
any group that's been together like that and gone through something like that and you try to come into, that's hard. Any coach that's taking over after somebody has had such a formative impact, that's hard too. Yeah, that particular, that was really tough. And, and any coach taking, coming into that environment, have, I mean, that was just going to be a tall task any, right. any way you look at it. But what ended up taking place, unfortunately, was um, instead of a new culture being established, the old culture was almost permitted. Like, hey, you guys do your thing. Um, and that's okay, but we're not, we're not going to lean into that culture, uh, but we're not going to define a new culture. And so what ended up happening was as the young guys came in, there were certain rules of that culture that we held very seriously within that generation. Right. Right. So a new guy coming in, you know, if he lets a ball drop that, and he doesn't dive, there's no effort displayed. That was a huge thing for us. Like no matter what, you don't have to get it, but there has to be effort applied. So we, we would start to see, you know, initially that ball would drop and we're all like, oh man, this is going to be gnarly thinking the coach was going to go crazy. The coach doesn't go crazy because it wasn't, he didn't sh- share the same value. He was probably looking at other values that were really important to him. And, and then it turned out to, you know, old guy going bananas on young guy. And it seemed like there was a genera- generational divide, but in reality, there just was no clear set of values that we all had to assent to, which made it uh, us less productive. I appreciate you sharing that. And I, as I'm thinking through it, the corollary is somebody, a CIO takes over at a new, at, at an organization. They really need to be intentional on what they're trying to do. What is the culture? This is why I like that exercise so much. And uh, a lot of the CIOs I coach are new in the role. And I'll say, uh, and they'll be like, well, I don't know if I have, if I, it's my place to really, I mean, this, you know, this place already has a culture. And my comment is, if you don't set it, it's going to be on autopilot. and You're not going to like where, where it goes. So we have to think through those, those elements. And it's, it's hard. It's, yeah. And it, it is a leadership thing. So you go to London and I, you know, what you're sort of setting up here is that London didn't, didn't go that well. No, we underperformed. We were the best team there. Um, and Oh, so this time going in, you were considered. I believe we were, yeah. I believe we were the best team, and we, but we didn't have a great quad. We didn't, we weren't. But once we got there, what was really fascinating, and, and I would like to encourage, you know, if you're a veteran in uh, an organization and you're feeling that tension, what, what happened to me is we were kind of grumpy at, at that point, just kind of like, unhappy and we and we did try to lean into relationship with the younger guys it wasn't their fault uh you know we didn't really have the discernment at the time to recognize all the different dynamics that were taking place Uh, but once we got to the olympics it was as if all of the little things that bothered us older guys kind of lifted because the olympics were so much bigger than that and so we sort of lost sight of of what we were after and getting so frustrated with the day, daily day in and out stuff. And so we were able to put together a pretty strong start to the Olympics and we won our pool. Um, but in the medal rounds, we faced Italy, who has kind of been our, you know, uh, a nemesis. And they got hot and we just didn't have underneath the hood sort of the backbone to stay strong under pressure. And, and we cracked it. And, you know, in a quarterfinal, it's over. You know, you lose a semifinal, you still have a chance to compete for a medal, medal right. in the bronze. And so that was really devastating, um, I think, for everybody involved. And again, uh, in hindsight, we probably all would do things differently. I know I would. But um, at the time, I would encourage that, yes, a new C- CI, CIO, C- yeah. CIO absolutely, if, if they don't come in, I mean, I think it's so great to sort of appreciate like, hey, that's awesome. I want to learn about that. But just know that that this is what we're going to do. And we all need to be on the same page so that we're speaking the same language and we're able to to work together. It's 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 actually in a collective instead of a bunch of independent forces. So you've learned a lot through the So you go to Rio and you guys medal again. Correct. Again, another reset. I, I there's a ton of stories from that. I, I do want to get to uh, the other two things. So you uh, you've transitioned from hardcore volleyball to sand volleyball talk talk about that a little bit 
Yeah, that was really interesting on, on a lot of different levels. Um, the, you know, the first being that indoor is a, is a team. It's a, the consummate team sport. Right. Um, there is no one player that can win a game. You, you depend on all these other touches. So to go from that out to the beach out here, which you're sort of, uh, it's just two on two, uh, but also there's no infrastructure. There's nobody choosing the team. There's nobody hiring you or, you know, whatever. And so it's actually like the South Pacific. With so all, do you go get a coach and you go get a... It's up to you. So it's kind of weird dynamics, right? So the coach doesn't hire the players. It's the player that hire the coach. coach. Yeah. And so you have all these weird dynamics. And I remember coming out right to this pier because I just live up the road. And I would see 40 to 60 guys all training sort of individually, um, but all having the same goal. So right away, I just said, this is, this is dumb. And I started to try to aggregate, like, hey, let's all train on the same court. Like, we can, we're all going for the same thing. That's fine. We can compete on the weekend. But between Monday and, and Friday, uh, let's be teammates. Let's figure out how to make each other better. Yeah. And that was kind of the first shift. And the second shift um, was the surface. So we're standing on sand right now. And what I noticed was that the hard court, for me to continue to play at a high level into, into my late 30s, I was taking like 2,400 milligrams of ibuprofen every day for like seven years so i know your listeners now are cringing being in the medical community uh but that was uh you know vitamin i we would call it that was the uh that was what worked for me you know a lot of people use a lot of heavier things but for whatever reason that just really worked to take down inflammation and, and allow my joints to sort of was it was it knees or is it the it was whole just body? all joint oh, okay and you know i think our bodies were created for amazing dynamic loading uh, but I just don't think that, that they were meant to spike 100 balls every day <laughs> twice a day so uh, there's going to be some give when you're tra asking it to do that over 25 years but when I came out to the sand um, I immediately got off of ibuprofen and I started to move around and after six months I gained five pounds of lean muscle mass at 38 or 39 yeah 38 and you know you know how hard that is like it's just it, yeah. it's hard to put on weight let alone muscle um well, it's not hard to put on weight but it's hard to put on muscle as we age and i started to think that man there's something here with the sand and so kind of those two elements kind of got my mind thinking uh about some business opportunities yeah so in sand is the program and i, I you guys actually do it down the down the way a little bit and yep. uh uh you have a bunch of different programs i went in the morning Mm -hmm. And uh, it's kind of neat. I mean, there's a community of people. Right. So uh, unlike a gym where you go in and you maybe talk to one or two people, get on your machine and do your thing. Uh, this was really a community of people out there working together, those kind of things. But all the all, everything you do is, is in the sand and uh, it, it affords you a lot of different uh, opportunities, I, I assume, from a from a fitness and a wellness standpoint. Correct. Yeah. So I think it's the ultimate training surface. And when I start to look at uh, my experience on the national team, I had an integrated team around me, right? So I had like six different experts that whose whole, sole job was to, to try to make me awesome and the team awesome. And that level of support is amazing. And when I sort of left that team atmosphere and I missed that, I started to recognize that like, man, staying in shape when you're not being paid to do it is, is hard to do. Uh, and then you add a 40 hour work week or a 60 hour work week. Uh, you add a lot of drive time, a lot of sitting time. I mean, your body can get, uh, pretty messed up. And so, uh, within sand, what we've recognized is that man going into a weight room and just isolating muscle groups to lift is not really what's needed in the greater marketplace, uh, and in, in the greater population, people need to have functional stability, mobility, uh, and strength. And what better way to do that on a surface that actually requires more muscle output without any joint impact. And so that's where the light bulb went on. And then the volleyball part. So we do sort of, you know, CrossFit really made working out a team sport. I, I give them credit for that. Yeah. So we, we were borrowing that. Uh, but we're utilizing sport based movements on the sand to just make it fun. But at the end of the day, we're just moving side to side, front to back and up and down. But it's amazing to watch. 20, 30, 40, 50, and 60 year olds be able to move around 
in a dynamic way on sand that has no adverse effects, only positive. Yeah, I was put in the uh, the older group, which yeah, <laughs> which was which was hard for me to be put in the older group. But the reality was, I, I've never played volleyball. Did a lot of different sports. Really, that hadn't played volleyball. So uh, being with that group, it didn't really matter. I mean, it was a lot of it. Really, was moving around, move to the side, you know, and it didn't matter where the ball went. It was really about moving and, and getting done. The other thing that was struck me about sand is, yeah, you could do a lot. It balances you like almost naturally yeah i mean i was leaning back and doing things that i wouldn't do on a hard surface right anyway it was a good program but, but you know people are listening to this and they're going well that's great in huntington beach because you got you know the beach as far as you can see right um but you know what's your vision for what does this look like in cleveland and st louis and dallas yeah i actually think it's harder here because you have 10 miles of coastline um but what people need to recognize is that uh, out here, this is very rare that we could be out here on an afternoon and it not, not be blown over by wind. Right. But wind adversely affects your experience on the sand. Uh, but it's our vision to take and bottle up this experience and, and take it around the nation and to build facilities that have sand underneath roof and, and indoors and to be able to allow people the opportunity in their busy lifestyles to engage in an activity that is, is an hour long, that hits all the major muscle groups without any pain. And I think, again, as we age, you know, little injuries become big problems and we don't have integrated healthcare for the most part. And so I've been spoiled my whole career to have surgeons and doctors on speed dial. Uh, but now that I'm sort of outside of that world, I'm recognizing that like, man, my knee hurts. So I'm like two weeks out of, from seeing this person and they refer me to this other person. They never talk yeah. who refers me to this other person. And so if we could build, you know, a center that, that has, you know, fun, fitness, pain-free all together yeah. um, with an integrated team, I think it's going to be a win. And a lot of people, a lot of companies have tried to bottle up the Southern California lifestyle but usually it looks like bikinis, beers, parties, you know, like that's what they think about the beach. But what people I think recognize when they come to California that, that aren't from here is that it's a really active community. Uh, at 5 a.m., you know, there's what, 100 surfers out in the water and the right. sun's not even up. There's people running up and down the beaches, running on the sand. And so if we could create centers that sort of capture that and, and, and take that across the U.S., I think, uh, I think it's going to be a, a fun experience. Yeah, and I think... Um People who are listening to this that are part of employer wellness programs, yes. I think is, is another opportunity. If you are a large employer in a city, you could bottle this up, create a, a space to do this for your employees. And uh, anyway, we've, we've talked about that and yes. you're like, that's, you know, step number two or step yeah. number three. And so, there, and it's, what's, you know, are you able to take the same intensity from volleyball to being an entrepreneur? Well, yeah, I think I, I, I mean, I think that that's what athletics has done for me is kind of shaped me into being who I am. So, so I'm really big on being integrated as an individual. So how I am at church on Sunday is the same way that I am on the court in a finals at the Manhattan Beach Open. Um, and I bring that intensity, uh, no doubt. Now I'm learning how to temper expectations in the business world because I got, I got news for myself that business is really hard. <laughs> But so um, it doesn't move at the same pace and it's larger teams and some of those teams don't report to you. And it's hard to know like who the opponent is sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, am, I, am I fighting against myself? Is it my inability to communicate the value proposition? Um, is there something else, you know, like against, I, I know who I'm playing against right. uh, when I'm on the court and sometimes you don't know who you're playing against. And, and a lot of times we can be distracted by, you know, other, our, our perceived competitors when, it, when in reality, it might just be our in-house processes that need, you know, some, some overhauling. But yeah, it's been, uh, I will say everything from sport is, is carrying over. And um, the biggest, most important thing is, is the team, dyna team dynamic and just recognizing that like, hey, uh, no, no thing has been invented or created or sustained uh, by a single individual. It's always been team. Yeah, and it was it was interesting to be with your team at the Max Potential thing because they are so committed to it. 
It's not that they're committed to it because they get huge paychecks and, and those kind of things. They're committed to it. They believe in the vision. And clearly the, the, the vision's been articulated um, so that they can grab onto it. But they're, you seem to have taken what your coaches had done and they're committed to each other. They don't want to let each other down. Mm -hmm. So how do, how do we make this work? That's what I saw. So let's talk about Max Potential a little bit because you're going to be coming out with a with a series. Is it a video series on on demand? Correct. Yeah. In a couple weeks, if you you know readpretty.com, you'll be able to register. Well, we're going to give the first module for free, and then the other seven modules will be a you know an opt in. Uh, but we're just trying to get this out there, and, and it's it's almost. Um, I mean, it's been so fulfilling to see. If you would have asked me to create a curriculum three years ago, I would have created a curriculum on how to be a better for volleyball player but over the last three years I've, I've been in enough situations uh, where I've been asked to speak or share at so many different industries uh, steel financial um, restaurant and I'm recognizing that that these principles are applicable in every domain you know when you talk about domain specialty expertise or mastery um, you know it, it's nothing earth-shatteringly new but maybe it's just phrased in a, in a way that might land with you. Um, and that was certainly the case for me. I played for so many great coaches. And uh, it's funny how the way one coach says it just computes one time, even though your other five have been saying it, you know, yeah. the same concept. So, yeah, that's uh, we're, we're looking to launch that in the next few weeks. I love it. I mean, the one thing I took out of it, and I appreciate you staying longer. Than oh, yeah. <laughs> the... Uh, the one thing that I, I mean, I took a lot of things out of the, uh, the principal process and, yeah. and black belt. That was interesting. But the, uh, the quad, the four quadrants to yes. me was the thing I've talked about, uh, over and over again. And it's, uh, you know, measured from, uh, casual to all in, and then it's uh, process to results. Yes. And, and if you, you know, you draw those quadrants and you realize if you're casual and results driven, um, you're probably frustrated. Yeah, I think is, is the right word for that. Yeah, but if you're casual and process driven, that's that's a hobby, and you enjoy those things. It's like yeah. golf, golf for the two of us. Right. Sometimes. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we uh, every now and then our mindset drifts, and then we don't enjoy golf as much because. Um, mm -hmm. But we're not we're not all in on it either. We're not process driven, mm -hmm. and all in is the upper right hand quadrant, and you know after I went to that session, I sat back and I thought about it. And I'm like, what am I actually all in on? Mm. And it was interesting. I started putting dots on the paper. It's like family, uh, work. And then I had to break work down into different things I'm trying to do in work. And I'm like, I realized I'm not all in on that. I'm not all in on that. Hmm. I am all in on that. And as I sort of painted that picture, it, uh, it was really fascinating. It was sort of a self-revealing kind of thing to go, gosh, I don't know why I expect results. You don't, you don't get results just for showing up. Right. You, you really do have to get all in. And and commit to process, not necessarily just the results. Right. It's, it's, it was fascinating. It was great. Great program. Well, Reed, thank you. Yeah. I appreciate your time. Thank Always you. a pleasure. Yeah, thanks uh, for having me. That's all for this week. Don't forget about our survey, thisweekhealth.com slash survey. We want your feedback, your your comments, your, your emails, and now the surveys really help to shape the show and make sure that we are delivering content that is valuable and, uh, and relevant to you. So please, thisweekhealth.com slash survey. If you want to support the fastest growing podcast in the health IT space, here are a few ways you can do that. Five ways. Share it with a peer. Sign up for insights and staff meeting on our website. Uh, interact with our social media content, Twitter Twitter, and, and LinkedIn primarily. Uh, post or repost our content. Uh, send me feedback uh, as always is extremely helpful. Bill at thisweekinhealthit.com. Uh, your insights will continue to shape the channel. This show is a production of This Week Health. For more great content, you can check out our website at thisweekhealth.com or our YouTube channel. Special thanks to our sponsors, VMware and Health Lyrics, for choosing to invest in developing the next generation of health leaders. Thanks for listening. That's all for now.